All right. So when I saw this talk on our on our um, RFPs, I, I, I kind of liked it a lot. So you got one of my votes for sure. So um, I'm going to let him introduce himself for sure. But uh, this is Nathan Sweeney. He's going to talk about commoditization of security solutions. And um, I'm just going to leave it at that. Sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot. I got to admit, I got beard envy. <laughs> It's close. It's close. He's, he's got the fullness, though, right? Right? All right. Um, all right. It's good to see everybody. The uh, commoditization of security solutions. Um, people look really tired. Is this nap time? Like, everybody, I see people walking in, they're like, oh, chair, I can sit back. Please try not to fall asleep. Um, if you do, it'll be okay. Um, I'm just going to kind of jump into this and get going. Uh, my name is Nathan Sweeney. I'm a senior security consultant for Secure Ideas. I've been doing security for a little over a decade. Uh, Secure Ideas, we do pen tests, training, arc reviews, consulting, whatever. A friend of mine calls us consultants. We'll do whatever you pay us for. That's not quite true, but, um, you know, whatever. Um, this talk is a little different for me. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I have the... Uh, one of those unique names, if you search me on Google, if you can remember how to find my, or spell my name, you'll find me. I'm, I'm, there was one other guy that had the name that died in like the 1800s. So he's got a, like a, a gravestone somewhere is the only thing you'll find. But, uh, and there's my, my crew. I'm proud to be one of the uh, organizers for B-Sides Oklahoma as well. So if anybody ever happens to be in Oklahoma, feel free to come check us out uh, next April, 11th through 13th. I'll throw in that free plug. Um, so... This talk uh, was an idea I had in, uh, I had several friends that had lost their jobs. They basically got downsized as your job's not really that important anymore. And then they had a hard time finding jobs. And, and talking with them and, and starting to see a similar thing at some of our clients, I started to recognize a pattern. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today is, is this pattern of commoditization. It's a big word, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time kind of explaining what that means and then how it affects you and, and what to do uh, career-wise to, to prevent yourself from becoming one of those uh, kind of casualties of, uh, of war. Um, my goal is to talk about the, uh, the, the progression of technology and security solutions um, from, from introduction to you know, just a common everything, everyday thing that everybody uses. Uh, so just kind of an outline of what we're going to be looking at. Uh, I'm going to walk through and talk about kind of the history of some security technologies, hopefully not too boring, but I kind of want to set a groundwork for this pattern uh, that I've noticed. And then we're going to talk about how InfoSec is different than other industries uh, and why it affects us more than others. Uh, and then specific things that we can do about it, what to do to make yourself more marketable. Uh, you know, when you're talking to the recruiter that, uh, that the folks before me were talking about, uh, things that uh, will help you be more, uh, more appealing uh, to those potential employers. Um, so commoditization, I got to get into a little bit about what this is. Uh, has, has anybody ever heard the word commoditization? Awesome. A good, did, did, does anybody feel comfortable explaining it? <laughs> I see a lot of hands like, ah, oh, maybe not. No. All right. So there's a legal definition of commoditization. And when I mean legal, I mean defined by the courts and, and the, the, the government and whatnot. Um, that tends to be focused around the, uh, there's a, it's called the Commodity Exchange Act that was, was uh, passed by the Congress back in the 30s. It's more focused on the legal definition of what is a commodity when it comes to trading and, and financial investing and that sort of thing. That's not at all what we're talking about. Um, I'm talking about more of a general definition of the process of commoditization. Um, with legal stuff, it tends to be a one or a zero. It's a commodity or not. It applies to the laws or it doesn't. Uh, what I'm talking about is a scale of commoditization. And so we're going to see several examples of, of different products and different technologies that are in different areas on that scale, um, just because real life is a little bit more um, fuzzy, I guess. Um, ultimately, commoditization is when proprietary things become generic. And what I mean by that is, you know, you have a new idea, somebody comes up with a new technology, it's, it's the cool new hotness, you know, they get a booth at some other conference down the street and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and get venture capitalists and all this stuff, and it's a big thing. Over time, it becomes built into an operating system. It becomes just an everyday technology that everybody uses. Um, so that's the process of commoditization. There's a lot of steps in the middle we'll talk about as we go here. Um, ultimately, commodities... I mean, when something is completely all the way at the end of the scale, at, at the commoditization scale, the choice of decisions is based on price. It's, do I want this one or this one? I don't care which one's cheaper. That's a commoditized item. Uh, the the uh, quote from Wikipedia there is helpful. It basically talks about taking the pricing power 
out of the hands of the manufacturer or the vendor and putting it in the hands of the buyer. So they can't just choose to sell it for whatever they want to sell it for. They have to sell it for whatever the market and what people are willing to pay for it. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. So some common examples of commoditization. Um, food, sugar, wheat, beef, milk. I mean, these are types of things when you go to the store, you don't think about which brand do I want, right? You don't go to, to, to get a thing of sugar and say, do I want this brand or that brand? Now, there are some things. Pe some people tend to buy the name brand sugar instead of the store brand, right? Um, that doesn't mean the product is any different. That's more of a, a personal, a, a psychological thing, right? There are people who are always going to buy the store brand. There's people who are always going to buy the, uh, the, the name brand. Uh, in, in fact, in a lot of cases, you have places where the manufacturer makes both. They put two different wrappers on it and send it to the same place. Uh, you see that a lot with uh, pharmaceuticals. You have drug manufacturers that after their, what is it, like 30-year trademark runs out, they continue to make the name brand, you know, like uh, uh, Advil. They continue to make Advil, but they take the exact same pills, put them in a, in a bottle, and, and label it with a generic ibuprofen, and they sell it for half the cost. And the reason they do that comes back to the psychological. Some people will buy one other than the other. But that is still a commodity because the, the, uh, the item hasn't changed. Um, when you go to buy ibuprofen, you don't say, I want this brand of ibuprofen over that one. You don't care. You get whichever one's the cheapest, generally. Um, some other things like oil, natural gas, gasoline, these are examples of uh, uh, things that are uh, legislated by the government, uh, what I was talking about, legal commodities. Um, same, same deal. If, you, if you're going to buy natural gas, if you're going to go fill up your propane tank, you don't care. And I know this is really non-technical, but you'll understand, hopefully, in a little bit while I'm, why I'm going this route. Um, gasoline, does anybody ever, like, do you have a gas station that you go to to buy gas that you'll drive, like, two miles out of your way to go to that gas station instead of this one? Yeah. What, what, what's the name of it? Anybody got, what's your favorite? Liberty, Quick Trip. Who said Quick Trip? Are you from Oklahoma? Atlanta, all right. Yeah, if you're from South Carolina, Atlanta, Tulsa, Quick Trip is the one. They're like, uh, you know, they're always on the top list of companies to work for, my favorite. They're based in Tulsa, by the way, so. Um, but yeah, that's a great example of the product itself is commoditized, but they've added value onto that commodity. There's, a, there's cleanliness, there's customer service, there's other things that make it valuable. So here in a few minutes we're going to talk about some things like that you can do um, to make yourself more valuable even though maybe your job has become more commoditized. Uh, and then lumber, cotton, light bulbs, these are all examples of things, gold, copper, silver, all, all types of things that you don't think about when you go to buy this thing. You don't think about what brand do I want. You just buy the cheapest one. Um, so some causes and effects of commoditization. And I put cause slash effect because it's really kind of a chicken and egg thing. Uh, the commoditization process, um, this stuff happens. It's just part of the process. Uh, I, I don't, somebody smarter than me has probably done a study about which causes and which effects and that sort of thing. It doesn't matter. Standardization is one uh, where you start to see you go from a lot of different features that, that have uh, different ways of working to kind of a standardization. If you go, go to Lowe's and buy a two by four, you can guarantee that it's going to be about the same as a low. Uh, two by four from Home Depot, right? It's, who cares? It's standardized. Uh, we see less differentiation between products. Um, we have more suppliers uh, of, of the products, and then we also have lower prices. Um, the, um, when we talk about, uh, la, 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 la. don't you hate that when you got like a thought and then you skip on and then you come back to it and it's not there anymore? It's a brain fart. It's a brain fart. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I just said fart on stage. Is that okay? <laughs> Thanks. All right. So moving on, we've talked about commoditization and kind of what that is. So what does this have to do with security? I want to step back a little bit and go through some, some kind of history of security technologies and, and things that we're all familiar with, but maybe we haven't thought about from the perspective of commoditization. Um, security is hard. I mean, I'm hoping if I'm assuming if anybody, if, if you have figured out security, if you fixed it, you wouldn't be in the uh, higher ground track looking for work or looking for, you know, how to improve yourself. Security is one of the things I don't think we're ever going to fix, right? There's always going to be something new. Um, there's a lot of great ideas. There's a lot of ideas and solutions that are out there. Um, you know, a lot of conferences have, you know, somebody pitching their next big thing that's going to fix everything. Um, I think if you walk around and talk to some of these guys out here, they, they could probably tell you why their product is the best. Um, it may be. It may not be, right? For every good one, there's probably 10 or 20 that aren't so good. Um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of 
supposedly silver bullets out there trying to trying to fix our problems with security. Um, there's also a lot of money involved, right? Just because of the value of the things that we're trying to protect, uh, the potential risk and all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of money being thrown at security. So that kind of comes into play with, with some of the products that we're going to talk about. Uh, there's a life cycle, uh, and this is, this is when I talked about, you know, I kind of started to notice this trend with security products. There's this life cycle in security technologies. It starts with a new idea. Usually at that point, it's really expensive. Uh, I, I think about like application whitelisting, you know, three, four, five years ago or whatever, I don't know, maybe longer than that, you know, when, uh, when bit nine was the solution for, for application whitelisting, it was incredibly expensive. That price has come down now, but, uh, there's, there's usually a lot, a lot of hype in the beginning with the new idea, right? Uh, sometimes it's FUD, sometimes it's legitimately earned. Uh, but there's usually a lot of hype and excitement about, about a new product. Um, it also tends to be complicated to integrate into your existing uh, architecture, your, your security posture. You know, hey, we've got these security controls in place. Now we need to come in here and roll out this new product. And wow, it's going to take all these extra resources and it's a lot of difficulty. What ends up happening is you have people becoming specialized in those areas and they become trained. And, you know, your job is to do this thing. Um, as we move on, going down, uh, you start to see more competition into the market. Uh, you start to see a fight for distinguishing features and um, different companies are trying to say, here's why mine is better than them or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, at that point, you start to get a battle for pricing. So they can no longer just charge, hey, here's our exorbitant prices. We now have to compete with somebody. And so the more competitors you have that enter the market, the more pricing that, that comes down. Um, as that happens, the products become easier to integrate. Um, there still tends to be a lot of work in those early stages, but you start to see the process of, you know, hey, this is becoming simpler. They're putting more effort into making it compatible with other products and that sort of thing. Um, and then as, as we kind of move into the full commoditization process, uh, what we start to see is very few unique features. Uh, it it kind of, the market has, has spoken on, here's the things that consumers want, here's the things that consumers don't care about. And so the different security solutions start to, and, and when I say security solutions, I'm talking about tech in general, but security specifically, they start to become more and more similar. Um, during this time period, prices drop considerably. Uh, you know, I remember when, uh, like antivirus, you could sell an antivirus uh, license for like 75 bucks a workstation. You know, now it's like Microsoft's giving it away as part of the operating system. So you see this, this trend of, of pricing dropping as, as the commoditization moves forward. Um, you also, at this point, you start to have lots of resellers uh, because it, it's really easy to set up. That's another thing I've noticed is that, um, you know, every value added reseller out there is adding this product line to, to whatever it is they sell because there's not that much training re required to get their people up and, uh, and, and moving with it. Uh, and then towards the very end of the line, and this is something I've seen more specifically with security solutions, uh, the tech tends to get built into other tech. So, um, you know, sometimes it's a, a licensing model. Like think, think IDS, right? You know, you used to have to go through all this work to set up a, an IDS system. Now, like, does anybody ever use like a SonicWall or Fortinet or Bastaro? I don't know if Bastaro is still around. You know, I mean, like, if you want to turn on IDS, how hard is it? You click the button. Like, that's it, right? You may have to pay for it for a licensing fee or whatever. But it's, it's simple. I mean, yeah, there's some tuning that can be done and you can make exceptions and all that kind of stuff. But the overall process is really, really simplified. Um, it ends up having very minimal technical uh, knowledge to configure. Uh, you also start to see a lot of acquisitions uh, at this point. And, and, you know, really throughout the commoditization process, but, but especially at the end. You know, you've got like Cisco buying SourceFire just so they can roll it into their, their products, uh, that sort of thing. So to walk through just some, some examples of, of what we're talking about here. Um, firewalls is a great example. Um, you know, initially... Um, Firewalls was a tech that it's, here's this separate device. You know, you've got your gateway. Does anybody remember when the gateway and the router were two separate devices? You know, and you've got your firewall over here. <laughs> I forgot you were Bank of America. <laughs> old school, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we're just old. I, I see this guy sit back there. I was like, I know that guy, but he's at the Bank of America. Okay. Anyway, um, so yeah, you know, you had this separate device and, and, and whatnot, and then they started rolling it in. Now it's just part of every, uh, every router to some degree. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm still old school enough. I hate it when people called a, like a Linksys, they'd buy a cheap little Linksys and they'd call it a firewall. I'm like, there's no firewall. It's a router. Yes, you have NAT routing. That is not a fire. It's a poor man's firewall, but sorry, I'm ranting. 
All right. Antivirus is a great example. Uh, you know, I mentioned before how, you know, Microsoft gives away antivirus as part of Windows 10, right? You know, they've, they've been doing that for a while, even with Security Essentials back on when they released that, 7 or Vista. You know, it was just, it was a giveaway thing. Like, that was a big thing where it used to, it was a huge money-making thing. I mean, people still make money out of it, um, but nowhere near as much as before. Uh, I tell people a lot of times, I, I use the example that firewall is like, or I'm sorry, antivirus is like a seatbelt. It's not going to prevent most accidents. It's probably not even going to stop you from getting hurt in most accidents, but it can help limit some damage. So, you know, it's good to have. IDS, I mentioned that as an example. Um, log monitoring is one of those that I don't feel like is quite as far on, along on the process, but we're starting to see it more and more as people are recognizing the importance of monitoring and alerting and, ke and keeping up with what's happening in your environment. Um, we're seeing log monitoring becoming um, uh, more mature and t uh, technologies are beginning to become more integrated so that it's easier. Uh, application whitelisting, I've kind of talked about that. Um, Two-factor authentication and password vaults, these are two that I feel like are just starting that process. Um, these are two technologies that I think are going to become very popular and they're going to become used everywhere. Um, you know, passwords are dead. The, we've been saying that for a while. Passwords suck. They're, there's, they're not good, um, but we still have to deal with them. And I think two-factor auth and, and, and password vaults are t some technologies. We're going to start to see more integrated closely with other technologies. Um, does anybody, I don't know, Hold on, I'm looking at the vendor. CyberArk's not in here, are they? All right. I think CyberArk is one of the, they're, they're awesome, by the way. If you run CyberArk, they're, you know, they're like the gold standard for, for password vaults. I think eventually they're going to get bought by somebody else and integrated into another solution. I think it's just natural. Um, I had a client just uh, last week send me an email. Hey, what do you think about this two-factor auth solution we're looking at? We're thinking about going with them. I don't, I don't know. They're like every other, right? They, we've gotten to the point where it's no longer here's the solution. It's here's 30 solution. Pick the one that works for you and is the cheapest and move along and, and just do it. Um, so I think we're going to see some of those. If, if your job, the reason I asked about CyberArk is if your job is um, uh, monitoring and, and managing a CyberArk installation, because there are people that that's all they do, you, you need to pay attention to the rest of this talk because uh, that job is going to go away. Um, and then consulting services. Um, I think this is one of those interesting places. Um, as pen testers, we've, had, we've started to see more and more commoditization in even the pen testing field. Um, there are more and more vendors out there offering cheaper and cheaper solutions. And so being able to demonstrate the value add that we provide, you know, hey, we don't just run this tool and give you a report. We actually go through the manual process of, of validating findings and actually doing manual testing and that sort of thing. And company X over here says, well, their price is half as much as yours. Why is this stuff that much more valuable, right? That's becoming harder and harder to do, especially as the tools get better, the automated solutions get better. And so we've kind of seen the writing on the wall. I don't think pen testing is ever going to go away. I think that's a religious argument we could have over beer. But I think the, the number of pen testing companies out there is going to come fewer and fewer. And I'm using pen testing as an example of consulting, but those types of consulting services tend to become fewer and fewer and, hard, and, and you may have fewer expert level people doing the jobs and a lot of people that are out of work saying, hey, where'd my, where'd my job go? So let's talk about the effects on security professionals. Um, how long do I have? Do I have to 325 or 330? 3.30? Okay, good. Um, so the effects on security professionals, um, you know, you start out uh, initially with lots of demand, right? There's, if you have this particular technology, this particular skill set, you can get a job anywhere. There's lots of options. Uh, over, eventually, the demand is saturated, and it's harder and harder to find that job. Um, initially, it's easy to specialize. Later on, specialization becomes kind of unnecessary. You know, it's easy to get that training up front. It's easy to say, hey, this is my job, and this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I'm good at. Over time, that all becomes automated and, and simplified so that, uh, yes, sir? I'm sorry, don't know what? Wordly map? Okay. Huh. No, I haven't done that. That's, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Okay. I'll check that out. I appreciate that. 
Um, so, and then obviously, right, you've got job security versus uh, you start to become seen as unnecessary. I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I've had several friends that they basically were downsized. They lost their job because the company says, what you're doing isn't important to us anymore. We can, we can automate that. Um, when I was talking about this with one of my coworkers, um, she just started with us. She used to work for an energy company and um, she laughed because she says, I love to replace people. Like she, she, and her, her thing was, I love scripting. And I'm like, what do you mean you love script? She's like, I love to replace people. You know, if, if, if I can look and, Hey, we've got these interns that are doing this, we've got these student workers or, you know, even more senior level people that are doing certain jobs. If I can automate their job, it either one frees them up to do something more important or two frees up the money that we're paying them so that, you know, we can use that somewhere else. So that kind of sucks if you're the guy being, you know, let go, but you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully, with this uh, advice that I'm, I'm giving, you can kind of help recognize that and, and find a better way to go. So why is InfoSec unique? Why are we a snowflake and, and this talk is worth talking about as opposed to every other industry? Um, it's really not to a complete degree. Um, you know, if you, is anybody a cold fusion developer? No, those, those guys are out on the street, right? They're not even in here looking for work. They're like, they're gone. Um, you know, I mean, there's cold fusion jobs out there, I suppose. There's got to be some companies that still have that stuff out there. But uh, it's, it's harder and harder to find the jobs because it's just not important. Uh, the commoditization process doesn't just affect InfoSec. Uh, it does happen everywhere. Um, there's some examples here. Uh, this morning, I was talking to a gentleman. I had to throw this in as an example. He said when he started, like years ago, he was a consultant. He did DHCP consulting for companies. He would come in and help them roll out DHCP in their environment. Like, I'm like, really? I, I'm not, I don't know how old this guy was. Like, I mean, that's always been pretty, pretty, you know, click button for me. Uh, maybe a larger environment, I don't know. But, uh, you know, he said, yeah, that's how he made money for a while was he was able to just uh, to do consulting, helping people roll out DHCP. He might have been telling me a story. I don't know. But, um, you know, the, it, there is a point where, you know, I was talking earlier back in the day where you had the gateway and the router and the firewall and the DHCP server and the DNS server and, you know, all these different devices. Um, now it's, it's much more automated. Um, point of sale solutions, POS, point of sale, not the other POS. Uh, I, I worked in, in point of sale for quite a while and used to, you could make a lot of money by being a value added reseller and putting all these things together and helping young businesses figure out what they need and helping older businesses figure out how to automate stuff. Nowadays, it's all just here, roll out the solution, click the buttons and move on. And so those companies are really having to retrain their employees and figure out how to maintain their business model. Um, ID management is another deal. I was talking to a gentleman this morning. You know, how many places do you go through that verify your ID, right? You walk in the door. I took my badge off, but you know, you hold up your, your, your thing, right? There's a person right there verifying that. Uh, you go through TSA and you show them your ID, you get onto the airplane and you got to scan your uh, boarding pass. Like there's so many places that we verify ID when the cops pull you over, uh, they want to check your driver's license. Um, that's all being automated. A lot of it we don't see yet. It's starting to happen more and more. Uh, this gentleman, he was telling me his company he works for and some of the stuff that they're doing in the next 10 years that world is going to change a lot. Like there's going to be a lot of people out of work, a lot of bouncers at bars that used to check IDs that they're not going to be necessary anymore. I don't know. They may still be necessary because you got the jerks that you got to check their ID. But uh, anyway, it, it's, it's, it's commoditization happens everywhere. Uh, I'm going to move on here. But with information security, it's a lot more, uh, a lot more powerful, a lot more, um, not efficient, but what's the, I can't think of the right word. It happens more quickly. Part of that is uh, an efficacy. I said shortened efficacy here. That's basically something's ability to be effective, right? The, the, the life cycle of when something is effective happens, changes more quickly with information security products. Uh, we have this constant arms race between you got a new attack, a new defense, new attack, new defense, and this is happening. Combined with the money that we talked about earlier, all this money that's being thrown into the industry, that, that speeds up that cycle so that these technologies are coming and going more quickly. Um, so it's hard to keep up, but there's some things we can do. Um, continuing education. Every industry has some level of continuing education, right? That, that's a requirement for everybody. My wife is uh, formally educated as a teacher, an elementary school teacher, and she has to do continuing education every year to, to maintain her, uh, her teaching license. But the types of things, you know, when you're teaching second and third graders, that doesn't change that much. I mean, yes, there's new techniques, there's new stuff. 
compared to our job, you know, like if you keep up with stuff on, on Twitter or, you know, whatever your, your media uh, choice is, there's things that are happening all the time and, and keeping up is difficult, um, which makes this process even uh, happen more, more quickly. Um, it's also increasingly difficult to keep up with age, right? As we get older, it's harder and harder just to keep up with all the, you know, understand everything, keep up with the new terminology. As we become more specialized, it's harder to keep up with, uh, with, with where we need to go. Uh, and there's fewer advancement opportunities. It's just kind of the natural funnel of, uh, of practicing professionals into management. Um, in InfoSec, I think that's magnified because InfoSec as a whole is a smaller portion of the organization. And so there's fewer management level positions to move into, you know, when you're, when you're at that point in your career. And then we also have incredibly high level uh, rates of burnout. And there, there's been some, several other of the uh, B-Sides folks have talked about that over the years, the last five or six years. There's been a lot of discussions and surveys on the levels of burnout for InfoSec professionals. So great, we understand that. What, about, what, what do we do about now? There, there's a couple specific things we need to do. First is to recognize the pattern. Um, don't get caught unaware. You know, don't sit back and, and find out, hey, wow, my job's really not important when the company lays you off. You should be recognizing what can I do to make myself more effective for my employer? What can I do to, um, you know, not just be a script that can be, uh, be written? Uh, for any technology, imagine potential development paths um, and, and plan accordingly, right? What can I do? Here's what I'm working with. Here's what I'm working with. Where are areas that I need to improve and move on? What, what possibly could be replaced here? Um, think about, you know, parts of your job that are likely to be minimized in five years. Think about where you want to go. Uh, it's also important to distinguish technologies from security concepts, right? The, the concept of like uh, least privilege, right? Or uh, identity and access management. Like those concepts aren't going to go away. The specific technologies will. So if your job is to manage a certain thing, dive more into the concepts and how you do that more than you do the specific technologies. Um, and then self-assessment. So honestly, ass ass Assess yourself. <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, think about what you're good at, where your skills are, what you're not good at, where you need to improve. Be prepared for that. Um, think about your strengths and your weaknesses, that sort of thing. Um, think about, you know, what is valuable to my employer? Why are they keeping me here? What am I providing that somebody else can't provide? What am I providing that can't be written into a script? Uh, and also, and this is hard for me to do, think about what might be enticing to your next employer. Because companies go away right? People get laid off. Sometimes things happen. Maybe you're just ready to move on. Always be thinking about what skills am I developing right now that's going to make me more enticing to my employer in five years. Um, more than just keep learning education-wise. Sorry, I know I'm done. I got one minute here, according to my timer. Um, get involved in a community. One of the great things about InfoSec is there are so many ways that you can get involved in the community, whether it's volunteering at conferences, uh, doing podcasts or blogs or YouTube videos. There's so many ways that you can get involved in the community, even if it's just being interactive on Twitter and discussing things with people and talking and, you know, pushing ideas forward and that kind of stuff. Get involved in the industry. Don't just be a job. Um, there's lots of ways to improve yourself. Uh, we've kind of talked about that already. So, and then lastly, just be proactive. Don't, uh, don't just sit back and wait for, for something to happen. So, all right. Any questions? I think I'm out of time anyway, so catch me out. We're definitely... Oh. All right. Anybody got any questions? Hands? Okay. He says no. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody.